السلام عليكم السلام ورحمة الله بسم الله الرحمن الرحيم الحمد لله الحمد لله رب العالمين نحمده ونستعين استغفر الله نشهد أن لا إله إلا الله وحده لا شريك له نشهد أن محمد نبدو ورسوله أما بعد To you, my beloved Imam, brothers and sisters, our invited guests, I'm always thankful to Allah and never take for granted the fact that He's given us another day, this opportunity to speak with each other. And we never ever want to waste your time. I pray to Allah the Almighty that the message that we will share with you, both Muslims and non-Muslims, will be one that you will take from this auditorium tonight and go to work. Because tonight I'm going to commission every one of you, especially the leaders, to do something. While we sit in this auditorium tonight, the government of the United States of America is planning to build colonies in space. While we watch a baseball game, or basketball game, or football game, there's some very serious thinkers in this country who late at night, while many of us sleep, they plan. 35 million miles from here, the planet Mars. The government of the United States of America has spent untold billions of dollars space exploration. And you know what? We have no doubt that we can build colonies in space. That's not what I'm concerned about. I think we can go there and build colonies on Mars and other planets. That's not my concern. My concern is that the problems that we have here on this earth, if we don't settle it here, whatever colonies we build in space, the same problems will be there. So tonight, I want to talk about a very crucial topic. This topic, terrorism in Islam, is not just for non-Muslims. You better know it. Every Muslim in this auditorium tonight, every Muslim in Toronto and in uh, London and all over Canada must know about this topic. So tonight I want to talk about who are the real terrorists. Who are the real terrorists? Brothers and sisters, Right now, somebody, real people, are creating an image or an atmosphere so that the masses of the people believe that Muslims are terrorists, fanatics, bad people, evil people. I want to share an experience with you that uh, happened to me about uh, four weeks ago. I was on my way from Los Angeles back here uh, to New York City. And when I got on the plane, I sat down in the uh, aisle seat waiting for the plane to take off. And as I sat down, a European-American woman came with her luggage and she excused herself and she sat down next to me on the uh, window seat. Now from my peripheral vision, I can see on the side as I'm looking forward, this woman is looking around, the plane. And I knew she was going to get up from the seat. 
<laughs> and uh, she got up and she got a baggage and said, um, uh, excuse me for a moment. And I watched her as she went in front of the plane and she crossed over and she sat in another seat. I said, fine, no problem, I got more space. <laughs> it's no problem, right? So I'm sitting there, still waiting, reading, and waiting for the plane to take off. Then all of a sudden, another woman coming, another younger European-American woman, and she has her luggage, and she sits down next to me, and she started looking around. <laughs> now, at that moment, I got a little paranoid, and I started checking myself out to make sure <laughs> that I was okay. <laughs> And I knew I was okay, but she got up and said, uh, excuse me, sir, but I'm getting off this plane and taking another plane. <laughs> and by the way, I sat by myself on that flight. A week later, I was in the city of Winnipeg, Canada. And, uh, you know, whenever you go from uh, one country to the other, you have to pass through security customs and immigration. And I had just received an award from the Muslims from Winnipeg. And I went through the security and came to the customs. And the security officer, he said, uh, um, he looked at my award and he, he stepped all the way back and said, what's that, a bomb? <laughs> now, brothers and sisters, either the man was joking or he was serious. Could you imagine what happened? I went to the uh, airport of Toronto and I go to the custom officer and said, ha ha, this is a bomb, ha ha ha, this is a bomb, ha <laughs> You know what happened to me? They would arrest me because you can't joke like that. Now, brothers and sisters, why would these women move away from me? What was on their mind? I'll tell you why. And I'll tell you why the customs officer said about me, whom he don't know, a bomb. Why would I have anything to do with a bomb? You don't know me. Because I look like a fundamentalist. I look like a terrorist. I have the image of a beard, a, a kufi, a thobe, or something like that. Because somebody is working, putting in the mind of the average Canadian citizen and the American citizen that Muslims are synonymous with terrorists. They know exactly what they're doing. And tonight, brothers and sisters, I like to uncover and ask the question, who are the real terrorists? Somebody is working. Now, brothers and sisters, right now, as I'm speaking to you in New York City, there's a trial taking place. Four Muslims are accused of blowing up the World Trade Center in February 26th of this year. A real tragedy. Six people lost their lives. And we ought not make mockery of that. It could have been any one of us. It could, in fact, have been a Muslim. Over a thousand people wounded. We don't make mockery of that. An act of terrorism for sure. But my question to you tonight, to this audience, who blew up the World Trade Center? I don't think that the people who did it is in custody. Brothers and sisters, I predicted about two years ago that the government of the United States of America is going to try to discredit Muslims, especially in New York City. Why New York City? You may not know this, that the Muslims in New York City has grown to such a degree that the mayor of New York City African-American, first African-American, has a good rapport with the Muslim community to such a degree that whenever there's a problem in the city, he calls Imam Suraj, Imam Al-Amin Abdul Latif, and the Muslims to get their input, to get their advice. 
And this man signed into law that the two days of the Eid is an official holiday in New York City. According to the governmental figures, there are between 800,000 and a million Muslims in New York City. 800,000 Muslims in New York City. If you understand who the real terrorists are, this is unacceptable. Who are they? Tonight I want to talk about three entities. Number one, the government of the United States of America. Number two, big business, multi-corporation. Number three, the media. Government of the United States of America, big business, and multi-corporation. Prophet Muhammad وسلم, said, the pen is lifted in three cases. Meaning that a person doesn't have responsibility for what they do under these circumstances. A person who's majnoon, crazy, insane. And if a person, while they're insane, does something that he's not held accountable by Allah because he's insane. Even in the courts of America and Canada, if a person commits a crime when he's insane, he doesn't go to jail. He goes to the hospital because he doesn't have a real motive because he's insane. Two, a person who sleep until they wake up. And if a person walks in their sleep and he gets a gun and he shoots someone, then there's no crime on that person because he sleeps. The pen is lifted. In the third case, a young uh, child until they reach the age of maturity. Young two-year-old baby doesn't understand what he's doing. So the pen is lifted. This teaches us a very crucial factor. Everything in life that is done Everything, every word, every action that people do, there has to be a motive for it. There's a reason why something that spurs people on make people do things, make people react the way they do. So a detective, whenever a crime is committed, they ask the question, what is the motive? <laughs> These are by motives. What is it that makes the man move, the woman move? What is it? What is the motive? Yes, what is the motive? Crucial question. When somebody commits a crime, why did they rob the man? He wanted money. Why did you hurt the, 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 the person? I don't like them, they're my enemy. Why? And unless you are insane, there's a reason why that spurs you, that drives you to do the things that you do. Now, brother and sister, I got a confession to make. You want to hear? Thank you. I used to watch a television program. Used to. See, I have an advantage over you. I used to be a Muslim. Most of you are born Muslim. I used to watch a, a, a movie, uh, of a, a detective program called Columbo. You heard it? <laughs> now, no, wait. I, I know you didn't see it, but you heard about it, right? <laughs> but you know something about this detective? I used to like Columbo. You know why? Because he was such a smart detective. You know, he would always throw the people off. You know, he'd start talking to the person, you know. He's just having a regular conversation, you know. And then he looked like he's going he's gonna to leave, you know, so he, He's, he's about to walk out the door, and he comes back, he said, you know what, I, something is puzzling me. You know, because he sees some glaring contradiction. 
And that's the trademark. You know, he walks away and he comes back and... Now, my brother and sister, this is this. February 26, World Trade Center was bombed. I was in the United Kingdom, so don't blame me. <laughs> now, I came back. They had gotten suspects who blew up the building. Muslims, of course, right? Now, now brothers and sisters, you got to remember this. In the United States and in Canada, the presumption of innocence is always there. A person is presumed innocent until proven guilty in a court of law. This is a presumption. Everybody has a presumption of innocence. You got to prove that the person did it. The person don't have to prove that he didn't do it. You must prove beyond a reasonable shadow of doubt that the person committed the crime. Huh? That's the way it is. That's law. Now, there's a man. They grab him. How did they grab him? Now, my sister, listen to me. Allah knows that I'm not supposed to teach you anything criminal. But today I'm going to take an exception. I'm going to teach you something about crime. And I, Imam, I'm sorry, please forgive me. Allah, please forgive me. I, I have to teach them something about crime. Now, this is very fundamental in crime. Whenever you want to rob a bank, don't rob banks, right? <laughs> don't. But whenever you want to rob a bank, never, ever, ever drive your own car to rob the bank. You steal a car. This is fundamental. Everybody knows that, right? Now, this person who was picked up for blowing up the World Trade Center, he rented the van. No problem. He didn't steal the van, he rented the van. No problem, right? But he used his right name. <laughs> Now, why would a person blow up a building, rent a van with his own name and his right address? Colombo. <laughs> and go back to ask for a refund. <laughs> now, my sister, either this is the dumbest criminal ever in the annals of history or the man was set up. Who set him up and why? Now, Sheikh Umar Abdul Rahman on every list of the United States government, don't let the man in the country because he is known as a Muslim fundamentalist. Don't let him in the country. But all of a sudden, Sheikh Umar Abdul Rahman is in America. Why? Who let him in? What's the reason? What's the motive? And why New York City? Then, after that, some people are picked up planning to blow up the United Nations the bridges and tunnels. And among those included are five Sudanese. Why Sudanese? Why New York City? What's the connection? Sheikh Abdul Rahman and the, and the so-called plot to build up the tunnels and the bridges and the plot to blow or the blowing up of the World Trade Center. All of them are connected in New York City for a reason. Tonight, I want to ask the question, answer the question, who are the real terrorists? Now, brothers and sisters, think with me. Some of you sitting here right now, you don't accept uh, conspiracies. Not a brother Siraj, no, there's no conspiracy. No coincidence. I say, no coincidence, conspiracy. Latest Time magazine, on the trial of terror, a person accused as the ringleader in the plot to blow up all of these uh, buildings in uh, Mahmoud in, 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 in New York City. Many, many uh, articles and newspapers and magazines, you read about that. Islamic fundamentalists, terrorists, and things like that. Now. I'm saying conspiracy, and the conspiracy against the Muslims, but the question is, what is the motive? What is the motive? Who and why?
Why? Why now? I was watching a television program about four weeks ago, early in the morning. These, these programs, by the way, come on early in the morning, like 4 o'clock, 5 o'clock in the morning. It's called the America Defense Monitor. The America Defense Monitor. What this program does, it talks, it analyzes about what's happening in America. In this particular morning, they talked about the number one enemy to the United States of America. This comes from the government to officials of the United States. Who did they say? Who did they say? Huh? Islam. No. They didn't say Muslims. They said Muslim fundamentalists. Muslim fundamentalists is a euphemism for Muslims. They can't say Muslims are the enemy. They'll never do that. They'll say Muslim fundamentalists. But they don't describe or define Muslim fundamentalists to the masses of the people. Therefore, Muslim fundamentalists are synonymous with Muslims. And that's why the ladies in the plane got up, because Brother Saraj looked like a Muslim fundamentalist. Because in the media, you don't get a definition of that. All you know, it is radical Muslims. It is Muslims. Now, Brother says, I really want you to follow me tonight. Okay? Because I intend to give you, share with you some information, to wake some of you up. Because, brothers and sisters, I'm telling you the truth. Many of us are absolutely dead. No, we dead. Now, you can sit here like you're alive, but I know dead when I see dead. I mean, really, a lot of us are blind to what's going on. I'm going to show you, I'm gonna show you why you're blind. I'm going to show you why, why we are blind. Okay? And I, I only mean tonight is to be a servant of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. I have no other agenda tonight but to be a servant of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. And I don't care. This information that I have for you tonight, brothers and sisters, people don't like me giving it to you. Because I'm not, I didn't, we didn't call you out tonight to give you a nice little sermon on how to fast, on how to make wudu. But what we're going to talk about tonight is very critical, very, very, very critical, very serious. And I intend, inshallah, if Allah blesses me, if he helps me through this lecture, to shake us, to wake us up, open up our eyes, and then put us on a path of what we're going to have to do. Now, brothers and sisters, I'm saying to you, absolutely, without a doubt, that there's conspiracy against Muslims and Islam. There's somebody, government, big business, and media, who do not want the masses of the people to recognize that the Muslims are the very best friends of Canada and America. You didn't hear what I just now said. I'm saying to you, the American people and the Canadian people have no better friends on the earth than Muslims. And there are people in the government, in big business, and the media who know it very well. Therefore, they're very skillful in making the masses of the people hate or be afraid of Muslims. Those who are in the audience who happen to be Jewish or Christian, I want to refer you to your own scripture, the Torah and the Gospel. In the Quran for Muslims, the story of Moses and Pharaoh. Brothers and sisters, know this. The Quran is not a history book. Uh -uh. It contains history. But it's deeper than that. This book, brothers and sisters, is so deep, so profound. I bear witness to the Prophet Muhammad Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam al Quran wa The best of you are those who learn Quran and teach it. Oh, brothers and sisters, would that we would read this Quran every day. It is so deep. It is so penetrating. There's so much light upon light upon light and guidance in the Quran. And if you're wise enough, you read the Quran, what happened 
thousands of years ago, is in it like for us to guide us in this life? Now, subhanAllah, you ever remember reading Pharaoh had some people with him to help to, see, to deceive the people. Who were they? Huh? The magicians. The magicians. Do you know who the modern magicians are? It's the media. The media will make your friends look like your enemies. They make your enemies look like your friends. Media. Magic of media. Image. Yes. Image. The media's image, man. And they're using today the media like Pharaoh of your own used the magicians to deceive the people. But Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala sent Moses to eat up the lies of the magicians. Yes. Think. 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 Pharaoh, according to the scripture, was one of the most powerful men of his time. Perhaps the most powerful. Wealth, army, power. And he subjected the children of Israel to slavery. Harsh treatment. Now think. Did not Pharaoh or Pharaoh plot to murder babies? Murder babies. All the male babies. Kill them. Is that a fact? Is it in the Quran? Is it in the Bible? Yes, it is. Why would this strong, healthy man, why would he murder babies? And why male babies? Because male babies will grow up to be men. Men who fight for justice, and men who will give their lives, and men who will kill. So kill them now while they're young, because if you allow them to grow, you're going to have to deal with them in the future. So deal with them now as babies. And so Phil out killed all of the babies, all of the male babies, Every one of them, he murdered babies, every one of them, except one. A boy named Moses. Moses, one. And so Allah revealed to the mother of Moses, put the baby in a basket. And so Allah sends the basket where? Right to the home of Pharaoh. To the home of Pharaoh. One baby! And the one baby that made it wind up becoming Moses, the very one to bring down Phil Allen. Think, think, think. President Farrell, I mean President Clinton. <laughs> I'm sorry. Uh, 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 I'm sorry. <laughs> <laughs> He's doing something. You gotta analyze it. You gotta ask yourself the question: Why, brothers and sisters? Because so many things happen. We don't ask, we don't ask ourselves why. We allow it to happen. Why are the United troops in Somalia? Why? What's the mission? So he comes on TV and says, "We have to stay there until the mission is over." What is the mission in Somalia? Why? Why did the United States of America put Sudan on the list of a terrorist nation? Why? When they know that terrorism doesn't come out of Sudan, why Sudan? How come the hostility toward Libya? How come the American government can go and destroy Iraq but don't have the guts to go to Bosnia where Muslims are being slaughtered? Why? Why? Because you know why? They got a plan, and they got a plot. And you know what? There's a partnership. The American government, big business. And brothers and sisters, if you really want to go to school, I'll tell you a fact. America is big business.
business, man. This is about business. It's about money. It's about profit. It don't care how many people die. As long as those in charge, powerful people can make money, they don't even care if people die. And the media, the co-partner in the conspiracy, the magicians, I'll prove it to you. I'll prove it to you right now. And all you got to do is think. I'll give you nothing but actual facts. Brothers and sisters, why the preoccupation with the World Trade Center bombing? I listened to the open arguments yesterday, uh, uh, I'm sorry, Monday. Monday, the, court, the trial began with the four uh, people accused of blowing up the World Trade Center. Now, the prosecutors, these are the people that's pushing the case that are charging them. They're telling the jurors, they said, look, in this court proceeding, in this case, you're not going to hear us say somebody saw them drive the van. You won't hear that. This is what they're saying. This is the prosecutor saying that. And, and, and we will not, you will not hear anyone say they saw these men blow up a building. You won't hear that. But you hear things like this. That somebody wrote a letter after the bombing claiming responsibility and we checked the saliva on the envelope and the saliva matches with one of these guys. <laughs> I'm not making this up, this is facts. <laughs> There was some nitroglycerin on the, on, on the clothing of one of them. Everything is circumstantial. Now, brothers and sisters, if you make the presumption of innocence, everything that these brothers did makes sense. Certainly, if you're not guilty of anything, you'll call the, the place, the rental, and say, somebody stole your van. Somebody stole the man's van. He came and said, somebody stole my van. Now I don't want my money back. It makes sense. I gave you the right address. I gave you my right name because I'm innocent. I didn't do anything. But if you presume that these men are guilty, then everything they did makes no sense at all. You with me so far? Yeah. yeah. Now, brother and sister, listen to me. You got to get it. 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 I have mentioned in this audience before, and I'm going to say it again because it's that important to me. What is terrorism? And why the preoccupation with the American government over the bombing of the World Trade Center? Because six people were murdered, right? That's too many people. We agree. But brothers and sisters, let me show you that how, how uh, the media is, is magic. What if I told you, in one year, over 400,000 people were murdered and no front page cover? You know why? Because the government Big business and the media combined together to keep it quiet. A conspiracy. 400,000 people in America alone died as a result of terrorism. But you don't read about it, but every day, World Trade Center, Muslim fundamentalists. Why? Because there is a conspiracy. Who are the real terrorists? What if I also told you? Around the world, last year, 2.5 million. And every fact I'm giving you can be documented, is documented. You can check it out. I'm not talking from my mind. I'm not throwing out figures. I can back every one of them up. 2.5 million people around the world were murdered in one year by terrorists. But you don't read about it nowhere. Why? Because they're conspiracy of silence by the American government. Brother, don't give out the papers yet. Don't give out the papers. Now, you know why? Let me tell you why. I need all the help I can get. Any kind of competition, I can't do it. <laughs> I'll give you a chance to do it, inshallah. Those who have the questions later on. Now, brothers and sisters, I admit that what I'm going to say right now is going to blow your mind. Now, I admit it. Really. I'm going to give you something right now. It's so strongly. It is so mind-boggling. 
It's going to blow your mind. So you better hold on. Are you ready? Mm -hmm. <laughs> you know, a, a funny thing on my way here um, from New York. First thing they gave me um, when we got on the plane was this thing here. I, I brought it here just in case you think I'd be making these things up. I, I brought it with me. And um, I'm going to show you what it is in a, in a second. This is um, it's called Boutique Shop on Board. Now, this is Brothers and Billings. The, the plane ride from New York City to Toronto is only one hour and ten minutes. But you know, they have a shop on, 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 on the plane. Yeah, they have a shop. You can go shopping right on the plane. No, you can't. Yeah, this is my proof right here, right? Yeah, now look, can I tell you what, what you have? Rum, uh, vodka, gin, scotch whiskey, Canadian whiskey, cigarettes, Marlboro, all kinds of cigarettes. Right on the plane, they make it convenient for you. And you know what? I, I hope the pilot's not drinking none of this stuff. <laughs> You'd be in trouble. Now, my sister, li li listen to this. And, and I admit that um, this is scary. What I'm talking about right now is something that's so dangerous that many people are affected by it. So dangerous that some people in this audience might be the victims of the very terrorism that I'm speaking about tonight. And you know what it is? <coughs> Cigarettes. Cigarettes. Tobacco. Cigarettes is the most uh, profitable business on this earth. It costs less than one half penny to produce one pack of cigarettes. Cigarettes. Every year in America, over 400,000 people lose their lives directly as a result of cigarettes. This is not debated. It is an actual fact. Cigarettes, that little thing, so powerful. This little white stick, over 4,000 chemicals in cigarette smoke. One of them a drug called nicotine. And even though you know that it's no good for your health, it makes your breath horrible. Your teeth yellow and brown. It takes from your life. Yet still, people have to light up. You tell people it's haram. It's makruha. It's this still. They have to light up. Why? Why? Because those in power, big business, and the media makes it look good. Advertisement. One company, Philip Morris, spent over $2 billion in one year to advertise <coughs> their product. Bringing in over $48 billion of revenue. More income than Saudi Arabia. $48 billion more than the gross national product of many countries. But wait, I didn't give you the best news yet, or the worst. Listen, listen. Right now, in China, 250 million people smoke 1.5 trillion cigarettes a year. Right now in China, 50 million Chinese youth, youth, Chinese youth alive today will eventually be dead directly as a result of tobacco, cigarette smoke. And check this out. By the year 2040, are you ready? Around the world, 12.5 million people will lose their lives every year as a result of cigarettes. 
What's the significance of this? Don't you think that the government should say, wait a minute, people are dying? Let's stop this. This is cruel. People are dying. Let's stop it. Why don't they stop it? You know why? Because the government gets theirs off up the top. Billions and billions and billions of dollars they make, and the states get 33 cents, 40 cents a pack of cigarettes. The state local governments get their cut from cigarettes. What's the real terrorism? And you know why nothing is done? Money. <coughs> Greed. Look. Listen. Do you know, brothers and sisters, every time there's a war, there are people that benefit. Businesses benefit from war. Think. If a military is going to gain billions of dollars of profits, if there's a war so they can sell their weapons and sell their army ammunition, is there a possibility that wars are started in order to get money? <clears throat> Self-interest, interest of the United States, Canadian interest. What are the interests? Oh, brother, sister, you know what? This is too heavy. It's too heavy. You know why? I realize most of us, I mean most of the people around the earth, they can't get it. <coughs> you know why? They don't see the real connection. Now, why would they try to make it appear as if the Muslims are the terrorists? Motive, right? What's the motive? I tell you what the motive is. In my conclusion, I'm almost finished. Because I know these things get very, very um, heavy. Right? But see, I want you to do something, by the way. I'm saying all of this because I want you to do something. I want um, Sheikh Abdel Hakim, our Imam here, and others who, and I always like to um, sing out our, our Imams and our leaders because they have a tremendous weight on their shoulders. What is this all about and, and, and why the Muslims? <coughs> Brothers and sisters, absolutely. The only ones who could stop this madness around the world this desire for wealth at all expenses. You may not know this about my country, America. America is one of the greatest terrorist nations on this earth. But you know what? They hide it with magic. And they appear to be so nice. Let's go to Somalia and feed the people. <laughs> the starving people in Somalia. Let us go and we bring the food and look what these savages are doing to us. But they don't show you what the American people are doing to them. And why? Why are you in Somalia? Even the American people are saying, bring our troops home. American troops being uh, dying in Somalia, but the American people saying, bring our troops home, and the president saying, no, we must stay there until we finish our objective. What is your objective, Mr. Clinton? Can I tell you what it is? All over the world, stop the rise of these Muslims. Why? Because the only hope for this world, peace on this earth, are Muslims. Why? You know what, brothers and sisters? I don't think we know who we are. Imam, I, I realized something. Two weeks ago, I had to go to Calvary to give a lecture. A lecture entitled, uh, The Role of the Muslim Women in Society. The Role of the Muslim Women in Society. I've given that speech before. But Imam, something happened that day. Early in the morning, 4 o'clock, I'll never forget it. The very same day I was supposed to get on a plane to go to Calvary, it hit me. Ah. Uh, I've heard speakers, the role of the Muslim women in society. I've read books, the role of the Muslim women in society. No, man. No. When you give a lecture, the role of the Muslim women in society, when there's non-Muslim women in the audience, you know what they do? They sit back as spectators, 
judging how a Muslim woman is supposed to act in the Islamic society. No, no good. You know what I learned, Imam? I understood. I didn't teach that topic that day. The topic that I taught was the role of the women in society. You know why? I looked in the audience and I saw all the non-Muslim men there. And I said, sir, I pointed to them. I said, look around. I said, you see these Muslim women with their long, beautiful scarves and their beautiful dresses? That's the way your wife is supposed to dress. These women are the vanguard. They're the first step. When Allah revealed the Quran, who did he reveal to? Where were the Muslims? There were no Muslims. So who is the Quran for? Not only for the Muslims, it's for society. Here I'm telling you, man, we have to stop it. Our job is to go to the people. Allah revealed to Prophet Muhammad, we have, sallam, we have sent you only as a mercy for mankind. And if Prophet Muhammad was a mercy for mankind, we have to be a mercy for mankind. If Prophet Muhammad was a, a, a mercy for all of the world, then Muslims must be in Canada, in Toronto. We must be a mercy for the people in this city. We'll never be a mercy until we go to them and give them the guidance, share with them what Allah has for them, not just for the Muslims. Allah. Allah. <clears throat> you understand what I'm saying? Because I'm coming home now. Look. Who are you? Brothers and sisters, who are you? <clears throat> don't you know the people here are dependent upon you? You don't even know that they're dependent upon you. We busy trying to be like them and they need guidance. You can't be like them, man. You gotta be different from them. You gotta say, here, come, come, madam. Come, follow me. Come, let me show you how to live a life. Come, sir. Come, madam. Come, prime minister. Come, representative. Come, politician. Come, come here. I will be an example for you here. And that's, that's our job. I read in the newspaper, man, a couple months ago, something really, it, it really uh, shocked me. It amazed me. There's one of the great baseball players, pitchers right now, named uh, Clemens. Roger Clemens. He plays for the... Um, See, I'm just testing you guys. You guys know everything, huh? <laughs> Boston Red Sox. I mean, the answer's coming out like that. <laughs> I mean, he's a great pitcher. Great pitcher, man. Right? He's driving all the way to the baseball. Of, um, uh, yeah. <laughs> and you know what happened? On the way to the stadium, he noticed a, a wounded dog on the road. That man, all the millions of dollars he made a year, got out of his car to go attend to that dog. And that dog bit him. Yeah. He lost a term, a pitching term. He had to go to the hospital. But I'm saying, I admire that. A man went to a, a baseball player, a rich baseball player, famous, went to attend to a dog. Now, to me, that sounds like what a Muslim would do. But listen to this. Listen. Don't give them out yet, brother. I'll give you the signal. <laughs> the ancients will give these cards out. Uh, almost, we almost finished. Brother says, you have just a couple more minutes? Oh, yeah, sure. Go ahead, Ian. Hours? Yeah. Don't you tell me that. <laughs> It'll be your fault. I'm almost finished. I want to, I'm, I'm beginning to now, um, to wind up and try to tie everything together, hopefully, inshallah. Now, brother and sister, listen. That reminded me Roger Clemens reminded me of our work here. Because you know why? Because while we're trying to help non-Muslims to see the light, to share with them the guidance that Allah has given to us, they're going to continue to attack us. I say this to you. Let them continue to write bad things about us, bad editorials. Let them curse us. Let them laugh at us, let them slander us. Still, let us go there and give them the guidance. Let them say all kind of mean and vicious things about us, even though they say mean, vicious, evil things about us, still give them the guidance. Because that's the way our Prophet Muhammad was, sallallahu alayhi wa Why the Muslims? Because really, 
There is no more power on this earth that can bring justice on this earth than Muslims. There is no power on earth. And if there's no good people that's going to check evil people, mischief will spread through this earth. Now, brothers and sisters, I close with this. You may not know this, but in governments, especially that are repressive, they always have a lot of spies to check the people, to make sure the people will never rebel against them. This is why Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala talks about Quran and the Prophet Muhammad sallallahu alayhi wa sallam talks about in Quran sallallahu about dhanna. That's any book of freedom in the dhanna. In the ba'd dhanna ithmoon. Stay away. From most cases of suspicion, for suspicion in some cases is a sin. You ever notice this? Listen. And by the way, and you got to remember this now. I'm not talking about this audience, so don't. I'm, I'm serious. I'm not talking about this audience. If a man is committing adultery, he begins to suspect his wife is committing adultery because when the person themselves and that's it. That's psychology. They themselves are doing it, and therefore they put it on other people. Other people must must be doing it. What are you, what are you doing? Where are you going? What time you be back? Where are you? They put it on somebody else. When people are unjust, leadership is unjust. Always there's going to be a paranoia of unjust leadership. So therefore, you have to spot check what the man is doing. Check the phones. Check the cars. Now listen. You may not know this. Toronto is an important city. It is. Islamically. And brothers and sisters, <coughs> what governments do, because they see Muslims as a threat, they send in your messages, your mosque, agents from the government. I'm going to spend two moments telling you the two kind of agents they send, and they send it here in Toronto also. The first agent comes to the masjid. All he does is observe. He don't say anything. Just watch. Watch who's against the imam. Who likes to be the imam? Watch who are nationalistic. Watch the brother or sister who has a weakness for drugs. Watch the man who's weak for women. Just watch. Because if you look and observe, you will see things. And you look and they observe and they take notes. And they go back and they get all the intelligence. And when they sit down and they compare all of the notes. Because the next man they're going to send in is not a man to watch and observe, but he's going to send what they call an agent provocateur. What is an agent provocateur? We're going to try to provoke these people to do something for our agenda. Now, we talk about unity. Let's keep the community together. Get all the communities in Toronto, get it together for the sake of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Somebody come. We don't want to get together. Because the agent provocateur must not allow the Muslims to come together. And the same way they do it locally, they do it internationally. So-called peace accord in the Middle East in Palestine was a brilliant move by the Jews. They're smart. Good move on their part. Why? <coughs> Give the parents of peace-loving people. And at the same time, create a buffer between us and the Muslims so that if the Muslims attack us, we don't have to fight them. We got our boy to do our fighting for us. Why you think the United States government pledging a PLO 
Two billion dollars. This is the beginning. Give them money, because if I give you money, you have to do my bidding. And my plan is stop the rise of the Muslims. I have it documented. The FBI in the United States of America instituted a plan years ago, COINTELPRO, pro, COINTELPRO, counterintelligence program, I quote, to stop the rise of a messiah, to stop the rise of a messiah, like Moses, like Muhammad, mm-hmm. like somebody that can unite. So now they send the agent provocateurs. Huh? They go next to the brother, who's very radical. Brother, look what these enemies are doing to us. We ought to, we ought to blow up one of those buildings and bridges. Yeah, you're right, brother. They got you for conspiracy. That easy. They whisper, they talk, involve you, push you, move you. Because they know, they've studied, they know your profile, they know your weakness, they know how to get to you, and they use everything. Don't you see that Shaitan watches us, him and his force, from a place we can't see them? But they see, they watch, they manipulate, they move. Why you? Because you are the one that can change it. Brother and sister, don't you know by the year 2050 in America, white people, European Americans will be a minority. And do you know Islam has grown so fast? Six million, eight million Muslims in America. Two years ago, I read the almanac. They said the population of Muslims in America is six million. In this year, I look, they said the population of the Muslims in America, two million. Hmm. Now, wait a minute, where the other four million? <laughs> you know what's happening? Islam is growing at a rapid pace. Everywhere you look, new schools, new, new masters, and they don't want to tell the people what's happening. Muslims are growing, don't you see it? They're growing, and if they're ever united, man, what a powerful group we would be. I gave a lecture at the University of Michigan, and when the lecture was over, in the back, there was a woman, a Jewish woman, a professor in the university. She says, um, uh, Imam Wahaj, tell me, if the Muslims ever became a majority of the people in America, would they then vote to implement the Sharia? <laughs> would they then vote to implement the Quran and the Sunnah as the guiding principle in Islam? You know what? These people always thinking ahead. Thinking ahead. Brothers and sisters, study the demographics of the earth and the world. You will see Islam rising everywhere. Every, the numbers are phenomenal. But there's a problem. The problem is we can't seem to get them together. Because somebody is working to keep us apart. Somebody is active. How to stop it? We must be as active as they are, trying to work for unity. I've come here, spill my face if you like. I'm still going to try to work on unity. Everywhere we go, trying to get the Muslims to go together to work together. Why New York City? Because in New York City, one of the greatest unifying acts is happening right now. 41 different Muslim communities working together, consistently growing. The Majesty Shore is growing. 15 communities ready to join it now. Soon, all 100 of the Muslim communities in New York City, inshallah, will be working together. Why? Because with willpower, we desire, we must, we will it into existence would be if they lack. I'll let nothing stop us to help us work together. And if we can do it in New York City, we can do it in any city. But somebody, somebody have to say, man, 
despite what you say and despite what you do, we still won't bring it together. And we're going to work together. Fisa did that. And this is the attitude that we have to have. And all the little differences. Don't let the shaitan come. Don't let the enemies come to divide us. Now, brothers and sisters, you know what this thing is all about? This thing is all about markets. Markets. If in a few years, by the year 2050, Pakistan, it will be India, the most populated nation on earth, China, Nigeria, and Pakistan. If the trend continues, dominated by Muslims, economic power, political power, how do you feed all these people? Economic, political power. And that's the bottom line, brothers and sisters. People in power don't want to see the Muslims develop economic power. It's not just praying. They don't mind. Go pray. No, pray. Stay in the masjid and pray. Please. And you know what? Listen. These women here, these Muslim women, who are the vanguard, who dare to be the first to step out to please Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, can have an impact on the Canadian people and the American people. And you will see these sisters will bring a transformation in the rest of the world. If they stand up and be what they're supposed to be, will be a transformation. Now look, I close with this. Brothers and sisters, you all, you in junior high school, stay there for now until you get your full-time school. Work to get your full-time school. But while you're there, you'll be an impact. Yeah, you'll be an impact. You can't, sisters. Sisters, you can't be like everybody else. Sisters, you got to listen to me. I'm talking to you. <laughs> I'm talking to you because if you, if you miss it now, you're going to miss something. You are special, and you got to feel like it. So when you're special, you go to school every day with a, with a purpose. I'm special. <laughs> I'm, I'm a Muslim. I want to do the will of Allah. Yes. I'm special. I, I have a mission. I want to do the will of Allah. That's the way we have to be. Because you know, brothers and sisters, let's face it. Consider we terrorists? No. Don't you know that we as Muslims don't even hurt animals, much less human beings? Listen to the Prophet. Wallahi, la yu'minu. Wallahi, la yu'minu. Wallahi, la yu'minu. Bila man. The Prophet said, I swear by Allah, he doesn't believe. I swear by Allah, he doesn't believe. I swear by Allah, he doesn't believe. They said, who? He said, that person whose neighbor is not secure from their harm. They're not supposed to run from us. They're not supposed to change seats on the plane. They're supposed to run to sit next to us. They shouldn't run when we buy a house in their neighborhood. They should run to be next to a Muslim. Because if he's a true Muslim, his neighbor is safe and secure. His neighbor is protected if he's a true Muslim. If he's a true Muslim, I don't care who your neighbor is, a Jew, a Christian, a man, a female, black or white, Canadian, American, a pagan, whoever your neighbor is, give him a gift and treat him with kindness. And the Prophet Muhammad Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam said that Angel Jibril kept talking, saying, be kind to your neighbor so much, he thought that Allah was going to make us, make them inherit from us, or us inherit from them. That's how kind we're supposed to be to our neighbors. 
and so our classmates. You be an example in your school. You don't backbite. You don't slander nobody. You go to school. You do your work. And you let the non-Muslim look at you as an example. When they look at the Muslim sister, they say, oh, that's Sister Fatima. She's so, she's so nice. I wish I could be like her. I wish I could be like Ahmed. <clears throat> on your job, brother, on your job, you be the best. You be the hardest worker. You don't try to, try to uh, on the job, try to get by, sneak, and sit down, rob your employer for hours of work, and you sit down and don't want to go to work? No, you Muslim, you go to work, and you work harder than anybody else because you're Muslim, and you're an example for the people of Canada. You are mercy for them. And they need to see something. And you know what? A book is not enough. Because Allah didn't send a book alone. Allah said the man, Muhammad, sallallahu alayhi wasallam, has an example of the book. So now people can see, they can relate, and say, yeah, this is the one I want to follow. In the same way, Muhammad, sallallahu alayhi wasallam, is not here. But you are here. And you must be a mercy now. Everywhere. Everywhere you go. Let the people Canadian, let them see us. Don't hide. Don't hide. Get up. Get out. And be proud of your being. If we do this, brothers and sisters, watch. You will see hundreds of thousands and millions of Canadians. A, either accepting Islam or B, at least becoming friends of Muslims. How to do it? Our behavior. And let's get to the media and show the real picture of Islam. I say this to you. They plan and plot. And Allah plans. And Allah's the best of plans. May Allah help us. Help this Ummah, help this Jama'ah here. Help the Jama'ahs to get together, inshallah, and show the world that we're not terrorists. Not by saying we're not terrorists, but by getting out there and showing our good works everywhere. I pray for the continued success of Toronto. I pray to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala that if Toronto can get together, then Vancouver, in Saskatoon, in Regina, in Winnipeg, in Montreal, in London, in all of the cities in Canada, inshallah, we'll get together. Inshallah, when that happens, we will show the people, no, we're not terrorists, but we will expose the terrorists and bring the people to guidance, inshallah. May Allah bless us. I mean, My brother, the speech you delivered had a big impact on me. How is it possible for others to gain um, this valuable knowledge? Asalaamu As Alaikum. My brother and sisters, um, one of the things that I really try to stress and push. You have a lot of great scholars in this area. I was speaking to some brothers this morning. You don't lack knowledge in the area of Toronto at all. You have a lot of brothers right here in the audience right now and sisters, you know, who are very, very knowledgeable. And I would say this, stay with the, the community. Don't isolate yourself. But stay with the Jama'at. And, I, and I, again, I pray that the Jama'ats would, um, would, would work together. Um, also, this is a perfect um, opportunity for us to mention the tapes. I'm going to say this, um, I've learned over the years, you know, years ago, um, there was a brother in our community, he used to make copies of my tapes, and he used to distribute them, and, um, and I never mattered, it never, it never bothered me, because as long as people were getting the information, but I found out that we had a way that we could spread this message in, in, in a greater way, and so we started making videos and audios of all the speeches that we've, or many speeches that we've given. One of the things that I've realized over the years, subhanAllah, is the impact of these, some of these speeches on people. Um, I was in um, London, England, and they, after I gave a talk, I noticed on the side there was a, a young lady, looked about 18 years old, and she was very shy, as if she wanted to say something to me. So I excused myself, and I went to her and said, uh, is, can I help you? And she said, yes. I just wanted to tell you, Brother Imam, that I have never really practiced Islam. Allah bless me, I attended um, one of your lectures, I got some of your tapes. Alhamdulillah, now I'm a full-fledged practicing Muslim. Mm -hmm. Not only that, she said she invited her friends, this is the United Kingdom, she invited her friends to listen to the tapes. She said 15 of them took shahada. 
just by the tapes. Someone says, I know that I made dua to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala that these tapes would be an asset to people that you would listen to them, people would listen to them, get something from it. Um, there is a um, audio tapes there for donation of $15 and video tapes, uh, video, video for $15 and audio for $5. I would suggest to you that if anyone here wants to buy a complete set, that we would give it to them for 50% discount. And so think about that. Some of you may want to get it for a library, even to bring your friends over to listen to them. So we have some new cassettes there also. There's a so a cassette and video that I recommend to you that we did recently called Hurricanes and Earthquakes. How to stop hurricanes and earthquakes. You might want to look at that. How to stop hurricanes, earthquakes, and floods. And there's a lot of them happening right now, inshallah. So uh, please, on the way out, stop there. Any other books or tapes that have it there, please <coughs> get it. Brother Siraj, how have you been a Muslim and how old are you? <laughs> Siraj, may Allah bless you. I wish I was your brother. <laughs> 13 years old. Thank you very much. You are my brother. <laughs> and um, because Allah says, never the movement of Echo, the believers are brothers. And whoever you are, you're 13 year old, um, I want to see you. And I want to talk to you afterwards, inshallah. Um, but I'm 75. And I was a fake Muslim in 1969. <laughs> Uh, question: We take. I will, I'll try to alternate also from the from the written questions and also questions from the floor. So feel free. Anybody have questions from the floor? It doesn't matter. Don't be shy. Anybody? Okay. Uh, Imam Abdul Hakim, could you please come up, please? Imam, he, he's saying no. I'm saying yes. Imam, you have to come. <laughs> Um, isn't it true that uh, two or three years ago that the Jews were put in charge of the security of the World Trade Center and when they had all the layouts and plans of the World Trade Center uh, they signed out Thank you. Um, I don't know that to be a fact but I tell you this and in fact most people don't know that um, the World Trade Center is a very highly has always been a highly secured area and anybody can't get in there you have to clear um, security. And again, I think that it's very um, strange that a very sophisticated bomb was made to blow up that building. And the, yet, the ones accused of doing it were such, really displayed themselves to be such fools if, in fact, they were, were the ones that were responsible. So I have a lot of questions in my mind about who um, was responsible for that. I'm going to, while I'm speaking to you, I'm going to be handing some, some things to the Imam. He's going to answer those questions, inshallah. I'm going to try to do a few of them. Uh, there is a trial of Muslims in Toronto, it's called the Toronto Five, that involves five Muslim brothers held for the conspiracy to bomb a Hindu uh, temple and movie house. The brothers have been held now for two years without bail. Could you comment? I would say, brothers and sisters, that remember the general rule that everybody is considered innocent until proven guilty. Even if a Muslim is, is charged with a crime, I think it's upon us to go there to find out, to ascertain the facts. This is what the Quran teaches us, and this is what our Prophet Muhammad said, that we should help our Muslim brother whether he's oppressed or oppressing. And if we find that our Muslim brothers and sisters are wrong, then we stop them from the oppression, and this way we help them. So I think we cannot abandon anyone, but rather we should go and, um, and find out um, all the information that we can. And we also should push, I'm not so uh, certain about the Constitution of Canada, but the United States government, it, um, it guarantees a, a speedy trial within reason. So two years seems to be very excessive, and especially without bail. Um, so everyone has a right to, because again, the, the, assumption, the assumption is that they're innocent. And if they're innocent, can you imagine being in jail for two years, even before the trial comes up? That seems to be very unjust to me. So I would recommend whoever is here will take the responsibility and um, to find out, inshallah. Amen. Bismillah ar-Rahman ar-Rahim. Alhamdulillah rabbil alameen. Sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. Sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. Muhammad wa alihi wa sallam. Assalamu alaykum wa rahmatullah. There is a question here concerning the situation in Somalia. 
this is a very deep uh, question, which I don't actually claim to be um, uh, act uh, 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 totally familiar with. It's saying that can the fighting occurring in Somalia be considered jihad in any way? I am confused as there are Muslims on both sides, Somalis and in the United Nations peacekeeping force as well. Now this question actually does require a very deep analysis. What I can say is that the concept of jihad in Islam, from a literal point of view, the word jihad really means a struggle against evil. So any time a Muslim is repelling evil, even if it be within uh, his self or herself, that is a form of jihad. So that if the people in Somalia who are being oppressed, who are being attacked, any points uh, actually are fighting against evil, defending a masjid, defending their homes against uh, troops, and they are unjustly being attacked, then it could be a form of jihad. But the, um, the formal jihad, which is called by an imam, or called by an emir, a leader of a Muslim community that is under attack, from my understanding, um, there is a confusion going on there in Mogadishu, because not only are there Muslim uh, brothers and sisters, but there are also other um, gangs of Somalis there who do not represent Islam. There are areas in Somalia, alhamdulillah, where there are strong Muslim groups. And it is my understanding, and Allah knows best, that um, it is coming close to the point where um, an actual jihad would be called, where we would hear openly that there is Muslim leadership based upon Quran and Sunnah that is making a, uh, a stand to defend the word of Allah and to defend um, Islamic lands. But as of yet, there hasn't been, um, from what I understand, a call made by any Jama'ah openly that is um, strongly and clearly defending the Quran and the Sunnah. So in general, it is a repulsion uh, from evil. But the actual formal jihad, which could be called by a jama'ah, hasn't been called as yet. And I want to, uh, uh, to open the floor to Brother um, Jamal or any of the other brothers, if anybody would like to make a comment on that, who, who actually knows better about the situation. Yeah. You'd like to comment? You know, the next question first, let's tie into it. Then make it Okay, I was saying, before this past Sunday's carnage in Mogadishu, um, which involved the, the, the Somalis in a Black Hawk U.S. military helicopter, which was shot down by the Somalis in the capital. Okay, um, the pilot died. However, the co-pilot and another crewman were injured. Two Somalis in Mogadishu uh, took these wounded men to the U.N. safe place. Unfortunately, the Toronto Star has carried uh, on its front page a Somali who was, uh, who was carrying or was holding a piece of a dead of a pilot's body. Um, while they are completely suppressed in the same uh, day, two Somalis saved his wounded colleagues and did not want to be known after taking them to safety. This could be one of the many ways of painting Muslims as terrorists, uh, cannibals, uh, etc. I would agree with this um, because the, the, the bombs that, that, were, that were thrown on the people there uh, in the city, actually there were hundreds of people killed and wounded in the city. And that is actually a savage act. Of course, Islam does not condone um, the disfacing, disfiguring, mutilation of any human body. And the, and the, the Prophet, peace be upon him, um, when uh, a Jewish person was uh, being buried, the janaza of a Jewish person passed him, he stood up and he uh, recognized this janaza. And they said to him, how can you stand up? This is a Jewish person. And he said, is this not a soul? In other words, this is a human being who is passing away. So therefore, Muslims have um, uh, great respect and hold sacred life in any form. So Islam does not condone this. But of course, you would have to look at the whole situation to be able to understand why a people who normally would not do this are reacting in such a way. You have to look at the whole situation. And what was happening in Vietnam, um, unfortunately, um, mass murders and rapings and, and, and the poisons being dropped and the bombs created a reaction 
in the Vietnamese people, which was depicted as being a savage thing as well, but it came up later on, what the American troops were doing, who were involved in, in the fighting in Vietnam. So I would agree that um, uh, this is, again, part of the magic which is being used to make a wrong picture of Islam. The general principle Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala gives us the ayah of the Quran and explains it very beautifully. And these are the boundaries of Allah, don't go past them. In Islam, we have a right to defend ourselves. We don't have a right to attack innocent people. Even, alhamdulillah, the Islamic system is so perfect. You know, I, I gave a, a talk in the, um, the University of Ottawa just last week. <laughs> and you would never believe this question. A, a person wrote the question down and said, I'm a, I'm a non Muslim. And the thing that I don't like about Islam is that every question you have an answer. <laughs> you know? and, and it says, you know, uh, you, you can't, you know, the Quran has the answer for everything. You can't have your own opinion. And I said, absolutely. This is the beautiful thing. This is the beautiful thing about Al-Islam. It is not right. It's not befitting or proper for a believer, male or female, to have an opinion or option after Allah and His Messenger has decided an affair. So in the Islam, even war is not left to our discretion. And if you study that classical generation, the followers of Prophet Muhammad Sallallahu Alaihi they were so great that they didn't even fight back until Allah Subhanahu Wa Ta'ala revealed in the Qur'an that permission was given to fight back. And even the Prophet Muhammad Sallallahu gave us the protocols of war. You don't kill women, you don't kill old people, you don't uh, chop down the trees and, and, and those kinds of things. So the terrorism, my, my good brother, will be against that, will go beyond that. The goal to kill innocent people. And to me, to blow up a, a, a building um, of innocent people is absolutely prohibited, absolutely uh, a terrorist act. Now, um, and you got to also remember is that this, uh, the people, the innocent people, I say, who were uh, blown up in that building, they could have been Muslims. But not. But 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 the, but the thing that I'm concerned about is that the selective terrorism by the media, that whenever it appears as if some Muslim has committed some crime, is the act of terrorism. Go right now and look what's happening in, in Moscow. Could you imagine if there were Muslims in that building? who took over the building with weapons. It would be over the, over the blasted over the whole world, Muslim terrorists. But they don't use that word terrorist there. So the media is very carefully selecting the word terrorism to somehow connect with Muslims and Muslim activities. Even for Muslims are defending themselves, um, they call other people freedom fighters or even rebels. But they call them uh, Muslims. So my point is, my, my, my point is, so for us, is to follow the Quran and the Sunnah to the right to, to the degree that we have to defend ourselves in a jihad, fighting against those who fight against us. Even the Prophet Muhammad gave us permission. Some per person asks, Ya Rasulullah, what should I do if someone tries to take my property? He said, Don't give it to him. He said, Well, if they try to fight him, he said, Fight him back. He says, Well, what if what if they kill me? He said, You'll be in, in paradise. He said, What if I kill them? So he'll be in a hellfire. So even there, the Prophet Muhammad give us the boundaries of having the right to, to, to defend ourselves. Uh, can I ask you, uh, what if the ruler of the country is ruling against Islam 90% Muslim, as in the case of Egypt? Mm -hmm. What would your point uh, What I would do is give the mic to Sheikh Abdul Hakim. <laughs> <laughs> I think it's very important for us to distinguish ourselves from revolutionaries. There's a concept uh, in the 20th century of worldwide revolution, leftism, leftists. Okay, and there's a concept of coup d'état. There's a concept of a group who um, uh, conspires to take over power. They see themselves as a power group, and so they will 
use any means, by any means necessary. The ends justifies the means. And they'll use any means to overthrow the government to institute themselves in power. This is not the Islamic system. Our system comes from the Prophet, peace and blessings be upon him, and it is clear that in the thir first 13 years, the Meccan period, that during that time, not until the end, were they even able to think about defending themselves. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala first built in them character. They had to go through a period of tarbiyah, education, where they, where, where they were trained and, and where they came to the consciousness of, of Islam, the fear of Allah, before they were even allowed to defend themselves. So therefore, you will find the methodology of most of the well-learned Islamic scholars is that we first build up the consciousness of the people in the country itself. We first educate the people as to what is Islam. We first lay the groundwork. And then when the response comes from the government, if the government is corrupt at that point, and then if it moves on you, it is a response that comes from the masses of the people not just from individuals, it comes from the masses of the people, a natural response that continues on for a total change in the society. So we are, we are not pacifists, okay? We have to get that straight, we're not pacifists. But we do not use violence except for the, the, the extreme position. Okay, in other words, we believe in self-defense and we believe in opposing evil. And so it is not an extreme who uses uh, our violence and, and you say terror or they sell terrorism as a means of gain in the end. You kill innocent people, no. The ends do not justify the means. We are not supposed to intend to kill innocent people. We would prefer to wait for the will of Allah to come about and have patience as opposed to trying to create uh, confusion in the society. So that there, there is a big difference between that. But, I want to make it clear from my understanding of Sheikh Umar Abdurrahman and many other scholars of Islam, when they're asked the question, they give you the hukum, they give you the judgment based upon the fiqh, the Quran and the Sunnah. And so just by giving a judgment based on Quran and Sunnah, they're now put into a conspiracy. So any Imam who stands up and, and, and quotes from Surah Tawba, who talks about Muslims fighting and you know, opposing evil, standing against evil now, um, um, or, or, or or who talks about the three levels of changing evil, one with changing with your hands, they can also now be put into a conspiracy because they are quoting from the Quran. So what has happened with him and with other people is that they are only merely showing what Islam is really about, and then they're being put into a conspiracy as a means of trying to chop the head off the body, trying to take away those people who are not afraid to speak out about what Islam really is. I'll just make a couple of announcements before we pass on the mic to Siraj. Um, there's a Dawah table uh, booth operating every Saturday between the hours of 12 and 5 p.m. in front of the Eden Center. And um, some brothers are getting together and handing out Dawah literature about Islam. So please contact Brother Iqbal Ahmed. That's Ike, for those of you who know him well. Now, uh, first, um, it says, um, Brother, stay in Toronto. <laughs> Uh, these uh, three questions are all related. A number of you had questions like this. It says, I understand that um, those from you accused Muslims are the ones who bombed the World Trade Center. But what? But um, I guess what they're saying is that perhaps it was done by the Messiah, which is the Jewish Zionists, uh, uh, agency, uh, secret agency. Uh, please clear this up to me. I'll do all three of them together. You still did not uh, mention who bombed the World Trade Center and why. It should come to no surprise that Israel may be linked to the World Trade um, bombing. Absolutely. In 1954, in Egypt, Israel agents bombed American and Arab targets in Egypt to create hatred and tension between Arabs and Americans. Now, all of these uh, speculations are a possibility. And, and Ron says, I like to be honest. I, 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 if I don't have uh, the evidence, I'm not going to say it. But there's a strong possibility, certainly, that they could have done it. It's to the interest of some, uh, especially at that time, uh, Israeli government, that Muslims be looked upon in a very negative way. And these things are not, there's not nothing new. 
it's done in history. Um, uh, definitely, uh, the, see, my, the, major, the major question, I don't know who bombed the World Trade Center, but the major question is what's the objective? What, what are we trying to do? What, what, what was trying to be accomplished? The thing that I do know that was accomplished is that Muslims were accused of doing it. And it's given Muslims a bad eye in the eyes of the, of the, of the major media. <laughs> Whose interest is it to have Muslims look down upon? Uh, again, it's the, the, the government, uh, big business, and, and the media. When you talk about media, media is never some um, nebulous, strange, mysterious force. Media are people. The media is business. And the business is connected, the media business is connected with the other um, uh, businesses of, of, the, uh, of the world, um, big businesses. So again, can I say the Mossad did it? No. But I say one thing, it has the fingerprints of agencies like the Mossad. You know, the intrigue, uh, things like that. There's a question here, um, which is a continuation of what Imam Siraj was saying. I just wanted to make a point. Uh, it is saying, again, um, why are the American troops still in Somalia today? It's very important um, when we look at situations, um, especially when you see the United Nations going in an area and either supporting people or not supporting people, that there are issues that are placed in front of your face, but then there are other issues that are below the surface. Now, most people think about Somalia as a big desert and all the people are starving and it's a terrible place and everybody's trying to run away. But when you study the history of Somalia, what you will realize, number one, is that even from the time of ancient Egypt, the ancient Egyptians living in um, the, the, the northern part of Egypt now, lower Egypt, they recognized Somalia as a place of great mineral wealth. There was frankincense and myrrh and minerals, and it was one of the rich areas that the Egyptians used to go to in order to mine wealth, in order to gain riches and then come back into the other part of the Nile region. So um, recently, oil has been discovered in Somalia. So there is great potential in Somalia and the Sudan of, of a huge oil reservoir. So one of the reasons why the Americans are still there and other people are still interested in that place Number one is the oil. Two, the coastline of Somalia is rich with fish and undersea in terms of one of the next exploitations for the future, in terms of feeding the growing world population, will be to exploit the sea. And so the coastlines of Somalia also are very rich uh, with uh, uh, um, sea life. Also, it is a strategic position at the bottom of the Red Sea that opens up into East Africa, that opens to, to the, the Arabian Sea, which goes to the Indian Ocean and the, and, and, the, and the South China Sea. Also, the Sudan itself, the Upper Nile region, there and, and, and the rest of the Sudan and Lower Egypt could possibly be the breadbasket of the yes. whole of Africa. That is one, if, if the Nile River is exploited properly, if, if the, 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 the water is used to irrigate, the crops and the Sudanese government, the Islamic government, has already begun to do this, and they are self-sufficient now in grains. They are they are exporting grain, and so this has the potential of being the breadbasket of the whole of Africa. So therefore, this is one of the key strategic, politically, economically, socially uh, uh, places for the whole of, of of Africa. And even if you connect the Middle East to Africa, because it's really all one area. It is one of the key strategic places in that whole area. So the real mission was not to feed uh, our people in the famine. The real mission was to secure the position there uh, militarily and also to, to stop the possible rise of the Islamic State in the Sudan and the Somali people also to stop them from going toward an Islamic State and to be able to control the economics for the future of that region. Brothers and sisters, what we do, we, we're closing out. I'm going to do this uh, very, very briefly. Um, anyone who wants to stay extra, we can be informally up front. I'll be here for sure. We have to, I just want to just um, let you know that we have to travel tonight. We're going to another city. So have mercy upon me, inshallah. <laughs> My brother Saraj, assalamu alaikum. This isn't a question, but I just wanted to say that um, I think you should also emphasize how important it is to be a good student in terms of grades. 
Muslims should be, uh, try to be the smartest in their classes. This is also a way of making a statement and being significant. Uh, many youth don't recognize the importance of this as well as dressing and acting like a Muslim. This is also a way of, um, to display our character. I think that's very good. It doesn't need comment. How can uh, we create a system of accountability to guard against individuals acting on behalf of a given Muslim community without the consent of the community? The more we become organized, um, brothers and sisters, and again, especially organization through a majlis of imams, the more the imams can get together, work together, then become more accountable to the people. A few weeks ago in New York City, we had what's called a townhouse meeting of all the imams of the Majlis Shura, and gave the people a chance to question us, to, to criticize us, to critique us, and to give us their suggestions and their guidance. I recommend we do the same thing. Um, Uh, as I'm making, the present day atmosphere is similar to that of the Jews in Germany prior to World War II. In your opinion, can a uh, similar genocide occur to Muslims in the present day? Yes, it can, if we're not careful. It happened in Bosnia. The Muslims in Bosnia would never have dreamed that it would happen to them. It could happen to us if, uh, laugh, if we don't go out to the masses of the people and show them what Islam is. If we, in fact, agree that the media is making negative things against the Muslims. And the question is, what do we do about it? We can do something about it. We have access to the media also. We have access to the masses of the people. One of our greatest protections, brothers and sisters, I mean, Allah is our greatest protection. One of our great protections also is to go to the masses of the people. Because it is the government and the media that are trying to convince the masses of the people that we are negative bad people. So we have the responsibility to go out there and create a good image. Uh, I, I want to, at the same time, uh, to address this question very briefly, the question is, what are the positive things that New York Muslims are doing to counter the Islamic, so-called Islamic fundamentalism and Islamic militants? One of the things that we're doing, two things, number one is our own media. Allah blessed us, we created our own magazine, a magazine not just for Muslims, but for non-Muslims. We intend to create a um, newspaper, actually uh, ultimately a daily newspaper, to deal with all the issues. To bring, to bring to the masses of the people. Also right now it's our intention to buy a radio station and a, and a television station where we can have our own station and compete with the masses of the people. We believe that we can do it, inshallah. So that's one of our, our, our major objectives. Also, we meet with everybody uh, in, the, in, in the city, the great leaders, I mean, the, the big leaders, the politicians, the mayors, and things like that. I think that we should continue meeting with them and talking to the masses of the people. And what is the real cause of non-cooperation between leaders in mosques, both men and women? They all seem to recite the Quran. Brothers and sisters, I, I, I think that, I, think that um, I, I accept the sincerity of all of us. But let me say this to you as I close. You know, when I go to audiences like this, I know there are people in here, sitting here, who have different agendas. I know that. Uh, there are different groups out there that you're loyal to those groups. I understand that and different groups, I understand that. And so sometimes you, you'll come to a meeting like this just to undermine, you know? I'm gonna undermine this Shia, I'm gonna undermine the Sunni, I'm gonna undermine uh, Hezbo to Tahriya, I'm gonna undermine the Salafi. And if we go, so we come to meetings like that, we come with our agenda. And you know what? It doesn't sometimes come as a, a, a spirit of let's sit down and let's unite. And brothers and sisters, a lot of times we wind up fighting against tactics, which is the best direction to go. Even if you say Prophet Muhammad Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam, he did this. Uh, one person wrote me a note, Imam Siraj, you know, the, the unity is to follow the same path as the Prophet Muhammad Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam. Yeah, of course, who's going to deny that? But then there's different interpretations on how the Prophet moves and different levels of understanding. So I say this to you, brothers and sisters, don't come with the hidden agenda to try to stop the unity. Because remember, everybody's not going to follow your way. People have difference of opinion. So we should be tolerant enough with each other as long as we try to follow the same aqidah uh, as Prophet Muhammad Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam, the same uh, basic belief. May Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala bless all of you. And I make dua that we will continue to grow and to develop. Our brothers and sisters get stronger as individuals, stronger as families. And then may Allah help all of us believing, all of us in desperate need of the help and mercy of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. And I remind you, we have a responsibility 
to go there to the people and bring them this message. May Allah help us. Assalamu alaikum.